so fast that one day I got 12,000 case histories of people suffering from aspartame and crashed my computer. So uh, four support groups have been set up on the internet to take care of these people because finally they wondered. They'd been going from doctor to doctor. They read that and uh, they realized why they had MS. They realized about lupus. They realized about diabetes. Many of them called just hysterical, crying, you know, could this be true? Could this be true? But as they got off, their MS symptoms disappeared. People that were blind could see again. Now the current philosophy within the Food and Drug Administration is, let's go ahead and we'll approve this food additive or whatever is in here, and we'll let the people prove that it's dangerous. They were calling the uh, FDA, they were calling the hospitals, the doctors, they were calling the CDC. I got one email from the CDC, and they said, you know, people are calling over here. They're hysterical about this. I said, well, whose fault is it? You did the most damning investigation ever done. I said, and then you put this phony summary up there. Instead of, you know, you should be doing what I'm doing. You know, you are the Center for Disease Control. And we're having to alert the world, you know, because you people sold out. And then you, then you get up with this very terrible equation that says, well, if this thing only harms one in a million people, we'll consider it to be safe. Now, harms, they say kills. If it, if it kills only one in a million people, the FDA considers it to be safe. So what you have then by, that, by virtue of that is you're saying that as far as we're concerned, something that kills between 200 and 300 people a year, we consider safe. That doesn't work for the 200 or 300 people. And so if you're going to do that, you better have, a pro, better have a label somewhere that says safe means we'll kill no more than two or 300 people a year. And I, I, I want to pose that to people because I've had a conversation with some other federal regulators and I said, you know, with all the technology we have today, with all the advances in medicine and science, people are getting sicker. Has, has anyone noticed that? Uh, people are, are buying more pharmaceutical drugs to, to cure the very things that these chemical companies started to begin with. So I'm thinking from the womb to the tomb, you're going to be paying money to these pharmaceutical companies and they're going to be manipulating the politics so you get to consume all of their poisons, all of the toxins, fully untested. And we're going to see five or six years from now people coming down with new kinds of diseases, things that we've never even heard of today. You know, you have to take some responsibility for what you're putting in your mouth. But in this case, they have no way of knowing. They got the FDA lying to them. They got the CDC, the professional organizations. They go to the doctors. The doctors can't help them because they've been lied to, too. Doctors only know what they're taught. And they only believe what they're allowed to believe. So I think it was the year 1917, but I could be wrong. Somewhere in that era, they developed the electrocardiogram. The year before, indigestion was the number one cause of death in the United States. The year after electrocardiogram was invented, uh, myocardial infarction was the number one cause of death in the United States. So a lot of doctors are still back in, on the Nutrisweet issue. They're, they're still way back in the era before anybody allowed them to know anything wrong with it. These things are prolonged effects, and of course if a physician sees it, and they see a, a child with a seizure, uh, they're not going to connect it to the MSG or aspartame because they don't know about this research. They're not familiar with it. Uh, they'll just tell the mother, well, I don't see how that could be related, you know, something you drank when you were pregnant. We're about ready to meet Diane Fleming, who was convicted of murdering her husband by methanol poisoning. Her attorney neglected to mention that uh, he was a big consumer, her husband was a big consumer of aspartame products and aspartame breaks down into methanol and could have uh, been the cause of his death rather than her. That's a possibility that was never brought out in court and therefore she got 50 years in this prison. Um, so we're about ready to meet her and hear her side of the story, so stay tuned. Describe your husband to me. Tell me what he was like. Well, he was he kept he kept himself a lot. I don't think a lot of people knew him real well. You know, he didn't want to socialize with people at work or anything. He was 
very driven at work. Like, he never missed work, even the, the morning in question when he got up sick. And he's saying, oh, I feel terrible. But he went to work because that's what he did. We had a weight machine. We had a stair climber. We had a treadmill. And he read everything he could find about how to, the right way to do weights. And, you know, like you do sets instead of just doing it. You know, you do so many repetitions and stop for a minute and then do it again like three times or something like that. He was pretty much obsessed with building his body. He didn't want to be fat like his relatives. <laughs> he started reading about creatine and said that he wanted to try it and he talked about it for a while beforehand. And apparently what it does is it pulls the muscle, it pulls water to the muscles to pump them up more. I was wondering exactly what it was. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, that doesn't sound like a good idea, messing with the fluid balances in your body, pulling water from one place, you know, putting it someplace else. But, uh, and I think it had something to do with the recovery um, time. And he wanted to try that. And uh, we picked up some Gatorade. He was trying to decide what to put it in because you could mix it in, they said water or fruit juice, but water probably wouldn't taste too good and he didn't drink fruit juice. <laughs> So he said, well, maybe Gatorade. He thought he could tolerate that. So we got the, the 20 ounce bottles, like a case, I guess it was 24, it was assorted flavors. You know, he kind of tasted it, see how it tasted, and then sat in the fridge and went to the pool with our daughter and came back. Well, then he played basketball from about four until seven with the guys, mostly some guys from church and they would meet at the middle school. And came back and drank that. Even when he came back from playing ball, he wasn't feeling good, but it was very hot. That month, that summer, it got hot early. Even in May and early June, it was really hot. It, you know, and he always felt lousy. But I'm short of breath, I can't breathe. He was like, lay down, get up, and you know, he said he couldn't breathe. So I kept saying, well, do you want me to, you know, what, you know, do you want me to call the doctor again? Do you want, want me to take you to the hospital? What do you want me to do? And this went on for about a half an hour, I guess. And finally he said, okay, you can call the ambulance. Because he, I guess, finally started feeling that bad. Feeling, feeling bad enough, because you know how men are. They won't go or anything. So, called the ambulance and he was showing some signs of maybe being a little bit disoriented, but he was still talking and everything and answering the questions. The paramedics thought kind of what I did, that he was dehydrated from throwing up so much and that his electrolytes might have been out of whack because they said, well, we need to get some fluid in you and get some electrolytes. And um, his breathing was real fast. They you know, tried to get him to slow his respirations down. They said he was hyperventilating and they thought that was a lot of his problem. And they put him in the ambulance and, you know, transported him. And about, after we'd gotten out of our neighborhood and into- I have your attention, so I just count 1034, 1056 hours. And through the other neighborhood, and we were um, still kind of going on the back roads, they turned the lights on and that kind of scared me when they, because there wasn't traffic, it was um, so we were crossing over the lake. They turned the lights on, but I called his parents in after I'd um, done all the paperwork. You know, they took him on back, but I had to give them the insurance information and everything. They eventually called me back there, and he was still conscious, but he was way incoherent. You know, he wasn't making any sense, and he was real like wanting to get up off the gurney and everything and, and they finally had to give him some Ativan IV to calm him down because he wouldn't stay, you know. And what's that? Ativan is, um, it's in the same family as Valium. Um, wound up putting him then in the MICU, Medical Intensive Care.